Hello, KubeCon. Hello, everybody. My name is Tim, and this is my friend Kyle. We just pulled a fast one on you. We are not going to talk about IPv6 or dual stack, hardly at all. We chose the most boring, most pedestrian topic and title that we could possibly come up with just so that we could get up on the stage. Now we're going to talk about whatever we want. Uh. <laughs> Those of you who know me, uh, I've been around the project for a very long time. One of the roles that I have been privileged to play through this project is being part of the bootstrap steering committee. Our job was to look at what our community had been doing and to think about what made it successful and to set up the overarching governance that was going to carry that forward and make sure that the, that the project continued to be successful. We met and we agonized for days over how do we capture those principles? What are the things that are really important about this community? Because there's really, there's something special about this community and how do we capture that and keep it going? So we had lots of ideas there, but there was one principle that I think really captured it more than any other. And that principle is this, project over company. The project is more important than any one company. When we wrote those original steering docs, Kubernetes was already kind of a big project. Now, it is significantly bigger than that. Now, we love to get up here and talk about our community, but what does that really mean? Kubernetes community is made up of people, people from all walks of life, from all over the world, from every time zone, um, and importantly, from many, many companies. Sometimes, often, those companies are in direct competition with each other. But Kubernetes is so much bigger and so much more than any one of these companies could have done. We're t working together towards a common goal. Coopetition, without it, Kubernetes would not be but a fraction of what it is today. So since I've been around for a while, I've had a front row seat to all of this and, and what's going on. This is really the heart of what we think of as our community. Today, we'd like to tell you a little story about how this principle has allowed us to add a complicated new feature to Kubernetes and how it would absolutely not have been possible without our community. So like any software project, we've added capabilities and features over time. We've accumulated and accreted, and those things are in direct response to user demand, right? We get a lot of pull requests, a lot of feature issue, uh, issue uh, filed that are asking us to do things. And these things are contributed by lots of people with varying skill sets and varying sets of expertise. Now, anybody who's uh, played with Kubernetes can understand that networking can be tricky, right? And pretty much everybody here is probably familiar with TCP IP, right? Those dotted quads that you see, 10 dot, whatever, 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 um, those are actually IPv4, right? And when most of us think of TCP IP, we think of IPv4. Now, a little confession here. I am not actually a networking expert. Everything I know about networking, I've learned through Kubernetes. Um, but early on, somebody had to do it. I drew the short straw, so that was me. So what we're familiar with is IPv4, but there's this whole other thing that we ignored, IPv6. And like many projects in this space, we have quietly accumulated IPv4-isms. And that's not good. Our code base now is really locked into IPv4. So a couple of years ago, a handful of motivated people stepped up and decided we're going to fix this. And a working group was formed. This is how we do things in our community. And these folks did a ton of hard, grungy work, and they exercised most of the IPv4-isms from our code base. And they made Kubernetes compatible with IPv6. Hurrah, IPv6. We're done, right? So first of all, special thank you to all those people who stepped up and did that work. We're done. A bigger problem remains. Uh, the reality is users wanted to use IPv6 because they wanted to integrate with IoT, IoT compute-like computing stacks. But then these applications are not going to be deployed in vacuum, right? They need to integrate with existing IPv4 services, cloud, cloud services, endpoints, and apps. OG just wanted to use IPv6 because they ran out of addresses. Just recently, the EU handed out their last EU uh, IPv4 block. The EU has no more IPv4 addresses today. So when you think about it, users wanted to use IPv4 and IPv6 
and we call that dual stack. Easy problem, right? We just run IPv6 and we're done. So we started uh, this journey trying to do the work, and we start with the APIs, like any Kubernetes journey begins. We picked up the first API object, pod. Then we looked at it, and oops, it has one IP. But we need two, right? One for every family. We did the same for Node, and then Node has one CIDR. Oops, we need more. Services, endpoints, you get the picture. What we just realized is we've made a bad assumption. We've made an assumption that everything Kubernetes will always be single IP. Then, can you switch? <laughs> All right. So, as we looked at that, the assumption that we've made, actually, not only to the code base, but also to the ecosystem. Everything Kubernetes was just speaking single IP. From the bootstrap tools, to the load balancers, to the CNI, everything is single IP. It's everywhere. That challenge does not deter us as a, ch as a community. As a matter of fact, people get excited by challenges like that. With that spirit, a group of us started the work on dual stack, probably late 2017, October, November timeframe. By June 2018, they had a Kubernetes enhancement proposal, a KIP, as we call it. With everything that we wanted to change in Kubernetes, the KIP was just enormous, right? The team that picked that KIP detailed every single change, every impact, everything we needed to work on to bring dual stack. That KIP itself is an example of how to write KIP for Kubernetes, by the way. But then things happened, team couldn't carry it forward, and dual stack efforts stalled. Like everything Kubernetes, our ethos is ownership. Without owners, things doesn't exactly move forward. As Tim said earlier, the requirement, user requirements are, is our primary drive. The effort has stalled, but the requirement didn't go away. By 2019, it has become even more pressing. In our never-ending relay race, the baton has, was handed over to us. Myself as an implement, uh, on the implementation side, and Tim on the reviewer side, basically to make sure that I don't run too fast with scissors. With a new team in place, our first order of business was to get that cap, the uncompleted cap, over the finish line. And we did. The second order of business was to break this enormous effort into phases. We chose to go with three phases, each mapped roughly to a Copernetes release. First phase, we wanted to do the egress. We wanted to allow pods to do dual stack. Second phase, we wanted to do ingress. We wanted to allow traffic and clusters to receive dual stack traffic on both IPv6 and 4. And then the last phase is to bring this all together in our ecosystem, help load balancers, CNIs, bootstrap tools into their adoption journey. These changes are not exactly easy, but also we wanted to execute them the Kubernetes way. Having the feature is good, but it's not good enough. We wanted to make it easy to light up these features on your existing clusters. Not just that, we wanted to make sure that these changes are backward and forward compatible, meaning you don't have to exactly break your clusters that you're upgrading, hopefully. So now we have a problem. We have a new API problem that Kubernetes has never had before. How do we take a singular field and turn it into a plural field? and stay compatible with all of the clients that are out there because I think we have a few clients out in the wild. Um, how do we change the assumption of a single IP to multiple IPs across multiple resources, pods, nodes, services, endpoints? This was going to be a bit of a challenge. So we took it apart. All of the obvious solutions were unpleasant for various reasons. We really didn't want to rev the entire Kubernetes API to version two just for this. And even if we did, we still have to have a compatibility story anyway. 
Anybody who knows Kubernetes in our community knows we love a good debate. So we got into it. API reviewers and a bunch of other senior folks from the project who had good context came and we talked about this. At length, for literally months, we argued about this. So again, I want to put out a big thank you to all of the API reviewers and the folks who participated in this uh, debate. We came up with a model that mostly does what people would expect most of the time. I pretty, feel pretty good about that. So I don't want to bore you with the details of the API. I'm happy to talk about it later if you want. Uh, we won't go into those details now. But now that we know how to enact those changes, Cal started hacking. Let me tell you, this man is prolific. The resulting pull request was, uh, I think GitHub's official term is kind of large. Just the phase one, just egress, was over 5,500 lines of code. Uh, and it changed two core API types, pod and node. Uh, we consider those to be sort of high risk changes. Uh, so we had to think really hard about how to do those changes, uh, make sure that they were correct and they were complete. Um, and you know, we don't, like I said, we don't really want to break people's clusters if I can avoid it. Um, these are the sorts of PRs that reviewers bring pitchforks to. Um, we also had to change a bunch of core controllers. And I say we, but I really mean Cal. Um, I just stood back and watched. So we changed the endpoints controller, the node IPAM controller, the route controller. And this is all just phase one, remember? So now we're approaching the 115 code freeze date. It's, we can see it in our headlights. We're coming off of KubeCon EU. We're just coming out of a long weekend. We really want to get this thing into the release. But truthfully, time and review bandwidth are super limited. And everybody who sent me a pull request towards the end of a code freeze window understands uh, what that means. We realized that this PR needed to be sharded out. We needed help. This was more than a one-person effort. So we lit up the bat signal on SIG network. What happened after that is we were floored by the reaction. In a typical bat signal situation, you would expect one, two, three people to step up. No, not in this community. 18 people stepped up. 18 people stepped up to help. We split the review into multiple pieces. I personally remember. Who can cover this piece on the SIG call? A lot of people were saying, I, I can do that. We went through the daily crunch of review, fix, commit, as a collective, as a community. Ultimately, we made the decision to set out V115 release code, just to give us more time to review and give us more time to test this and just leave the change on our test grid. We missed our mark, but that's fine. The memory of that week is one of the memories that we as a community will cherish for a very long time to come. Admittedly, we were beaten. I was. I know I was. A lot of effort were put into this change. A lot of effort two years back were put to bring that change forward. We just fell a little short, but we were not defeated. We were back at it again the next release, V116. This time, we wanted to go bigger. We wanted to do egress and ingress. Ah, not because this is how mad we are in SIG network. We do. But by then, it was clear. We were supported by a very strong community. All right, let's do this again. Going back to the drawing board, another API discussions. You know, the one that we lovingly yell at each other for a while until we come to an agreement. This time, we wanted to change queue proxy, API server, load balancing. You know, it's just another small change. And we made that release. As of v116, Kubernetes supports dual stack. This is your cue to clap, by the way. Our journey is not over, never is. That's one thing for sure, the sky is clearer ahead. Kubernetes today supports dual stack on both egress and ingress paths. We are well underway on our phase three. I see friendly faces in the community helping. We have dual stack bootstrap, we have dual stack external load balancer, CNIs, you get, you get the picture by now. We are already thinking about what's next for Kubernetes networking. 
we want to go further. We want to enable multi-IP pods, be it dual stack or not. That will enable applications to do front-end, back-end, classic networking scenario. Anybody who's old enough like me will remember that. The other thing we also wanted is to make it easy to run networking virtual appliance on Kubernetes. We are super excited about the possibilities. We already unlocked these possibilities, so we just need to do the work. More importantly, personally and all of us, I think, we are super comfortable thinking big and bigger because we know by now the community will come and deliver against the future. So wrapping up, I feel like I should emphasize a few things. Almost none of us who pulled this off knew each other before this. This is, I think, the first time Cal and I have actually met. If it was again, it was at a KubeCon in passing. Uh, and you know, I don't even like this guy. I'm kind, of a, I'm kind of a Star Wars fan, and I hear he likes the other thing. Uh, <laughs> Almost none of us work for the same companies. Many of us don't work in the same countries, in the same time zones. But when we all pulled together, something really exciting and awesome, and I, and I really mean awesome in sort of a biblical sense, happened. This is what project over, over company means to me. This is why Kubernetes is what it is. So this talk is our little way of saying thank you. Thank you. <laughs>